of the proposition to open this self-entitlement. On side proposition, we believe, and this is our team line in this debate, that we have to act now and we have to act well. We have three points in constructive. First of all, why it is principally obligatory for the developing world to do this. Second of all, why it is good for the developing world to do this. And three, why it is economically more beneficial to transition now. My partner's going to talk about that. With that in mind, five points here in the model. Number one, we are going to rely on like the World Bank or United Nations definition of developing nations. For further reference, this includes Brazil, India, China, South Africa, those countries that are not confused. Second of all, this is going to be an aggressive transition. It is going to start now, and it is going to move in the direction of being completely free of all natural resources, which include oil, which include rare earth minerals, the whole lot. Three, no, thank you. We think this is going to be based on an expert recommendation, right? So we're going to consult scientists, they're going to consult the academic community. Fourth, those countries that currently pollute are going to stop polluting in the, mid in the midst of this transition. Countries that, sorry, that extract resources and countries that don't currently extract that much resources won't go any further in that direction. That being said, two points have been struck. First of all, the principal obligation. I want to make something very clear. I shouldn't have to, but I will, no thanks. The extraction of natural resources is bad for the environment. What are good examples of this? First of all, carbon pollution. When you release hydrocarbons into the atmosphere that have been concentrated in the ground for thousands of years, you lead to a global temperature increase. This means that the ice caps start to melt, which means that there's flooding, which means you get the extinction of species that are important to ecosystems around the world and that affect all countries in the world. It takes away food sources from real people, and it means that like in cases where the ocean starts to acidify, that the variability of new species to form and grow at all is diminished. First, second of all, why environmental sorry, why resource extraction is another reason why it's specifically bad is because it involves the destruction of existing like environments in existing green areas, which means you have to like deforest large amounts of areas, which means the soil is less irrigated, which means you can't have as much agriculture, right? And because extraction is really concentrated in specific areas, so the damage is really focused, right? That's why it's different from like the harm of you not recycling this afternoon, right? Okay. Why does the developing world specifically have an obligation to do this? First of all, because it is literally about the fate of the Earth, right? It's not enough to just say that, well, the developing world was allowed to do it, and that was really bad, so on the principle of reciprocity, the developing world gets to do it too, right? We have one Earth, and none of us will exist if that Earth is gone. This also means that developing the developing world pollution affects other countries on Earth, right? Countries that their citizens have absolutely nothing to do with. So even if their citizens support resource extraction, at the point where it causes countries to sink, at the point where the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef affects fishing in Japan, we think it is really important for the world to realize that this is a collective responsibility, not the responsibility of some alone. However, no thank you. We also think that the process of resource extraction is now more destructive than it has ever been. It is bigger because the technology is better, because you can do it faster, because you can do it more efficiently, you can sell it at a high rate, and because it is stronger, because we can extract in ways that we've never been able to extract before at like the very depths of the earth. We think that that's bad. Why should developing countries be the first one to take on this burden? Simply because we don't think the developed world is going to anytime soon, and we can no longer play this game of like, because you don't do it, we're not going to do it. This is about the fate of the earth. It's not enough to play a game of chicken. Go ahead. If the developed world is not doing it, why is me, as a developing country, should actively limit the opportunities of my people, the people who I have an obligation to, to actually get an education, get a proper health care, just right. because and some people are doing the job? My second argument I'm going to talk about this, the short answer is because if you do, your country won't exist in it. Right? <laughs> why is it specific to have resource extraction and environmental protection? 
Because it doesn't matter how many trees you plant or how many forests you protect, if you're eroding the soil to the point where nothing can grow anymore, it doesn't matter how much environmental restoration you pledge. Now I want to talk about why this is good for the developing world and the environment. Why is environmental security so important for specifically the developing world? Because they are less able to protect their people from environmental disaster. That is to say that when a tsunami hits a country like Indonesia, which is one of the most populated coastlines in the entire world, that government, by virtue of it being a developing state, has less of an ability to protect its people from that. Because the developing world has more resources than anywhere else on Earth, which means that every time they extract resources, they feel the most direct impact of that resource extraction, whereas the developing world can develop them like cross their fingers and hope it doesn't hit them, right? An example of this is the Nile River, which is polluted by a lot of countries who are on it, either through like, poor agricultural techniques, but also through lots of resource extraction that happens in that area. There are 11 countries dependent on that river, and given that its rate of evaporation is faster than it has ever been, we say now is the perfect time for developing countries to recognize that this is a threat to them. Also, there are other countries that are literally sinking, right? If you look at the example of the Maldives, that country will be underwater in our lifetime. I don't think I can stress this anymore. The, the, the entire nation of Madagascar, with such severe soil erosion, erosion is bit by bit sinking into the ocean. Furthermore, this destruction is permanent, right? A lot of it can't be undone. So once that destruction is done, and once all the millions of people die, there's no way you can like undo the negative environmental circumstances in which that happened, because the ice caps don't just recrystallize because you want them to. Okay. Why is green development and the status quo so difficult, and why do we change that? First of all, because the technology simply isn't as invested into it. We can develop it as fast as we develop like the steam, net, steam engine and the coal engine that's largely arbitrary. But why has that continued until now? Largely because of regulation, because there are external bodies that have incentives in keeping that in place. Because even if we said that the free market determined that green energy was better, it would still be more profitable for rich energy companies to just lobby the governments to put subsidies on the price of oil and rare earth and minerals to make them comparatively cheaper, and Saudi Arabia can decide when to pump oil and when not to pump oil, and that's all that decision of OPEC for an unaccountable body, because the amount of capital required to change to green energy is expensive, and like, let's face it, rich people don't like spending money if they don't have to. Okay, why does that change on our subjects? First of all, there is a massive supply chain, right? Most resources exist in the developing world. At the point where they say, no, you can't keep extracting these, the price of these resources will go up dramatically, which means that now energy companies in the developed world can't rely on these resources to make profit anymore. Why is this so good for green energy? Because now they are forced to invest in it. They're still an energy company. They still want to make money. So they're going to do what they did in France, and they're going to invest in nuclear energy. And now they have the developing world, which is quite literally the largest market on Earth. And then they are going to go into those countries, invest in the infrastructure there to build that technology, so that the same quality of service in the developed world will now have a financial incentive to be produced in the developing world due to manipulate them externally. Second of all, political will. What is the climate of COP21 that you currently see? For the first time, because Californians have to deal with a little bit of drought, because there's fires in Alberta, because New Yorkers have to deal with some snow, all of a sudden, people in the developed world actually care about this. So that's why they care when their presidents go to these climate conferences. The reason it was delayed was because they were blaming it on the developing world for not taking action. Once they take that action, they point the finger at the developing world, and the developed world will say, you're next, it's your time to take the burden. We can't wait any longer. There are people currently dying for resource extraction-based destruction. We want to limit that death. We care about the Earth. We're extremely proud to propose. Thank you very much.
Minister of the Opposition. So So we think that um, the majority of this is actually going to clash with my first point, but let's deal with what it doesn't I like deal with. A, we tell you that when like you can't succumb, like when you don't prioritize your own resources, you have to succumb to the exploitative things such as factories, like such as tide aid that actually come into my country, right? The thing is with that is it still pollutes just as much because I'm what I have sweatshops. The only difference is that I as a government am getting exploited now and my people are getting exploited. We tell you that that is like mitigatory at best. Secondly, we tell you that it's actually unjustified. I'll explain this more on my point, but basically that's actually punishing the statement for something that is not even our fault. We'll tell you why this is principally unjustified. But thirdly, we have to recognize that there is innovation to make resource extraction a lot better, right? We think that we're okay using those technologies on our second host. We think we're going to do it with the less economic hog as possible. But even if we go like fully buried from mind to hog, say like, screw the environment, we need to prioritize it. I, 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 sorry, we are people. Why is this okay? Because as I said in my snappy intro, my people are dying now, right? They lack the resource they need right now. We think it doesn't matter what happens 40 years in the future. We need to make sure what happens right now. But fifthly, again, we tell you it's mitigatory at best, because the biggest contributors to pollution are those in the developed world. We tell you again, like if I'm going to like die anyways, if my country's going to disappear underwater, I might as well have a good life. What did they tell you at their next point? They basically told you this idea of like, they gave you like nine examples in a row. So again, like we say like nice examples, but we actually need like some analysis there. But secondly, we tell you it's the like burden of the developed world, not the developing world, to actually get this change done. And again, thirdly, we tell you it's mitigate, a, a mitigatory test. And lastly, their idea was the whole idea of resource competition and how the prices are going to go up. Ladies and gentlemen, if the demand is so large, we tell you that these companies are going to move to countries such as Canada and the Scandinavian countries to get the same oil, right? The only difference here is that these countries are reaping the benefits and my country isn't. We don't support that on our side of the house. All right, first point. How is, why is this principally justified to support this? So the first thing we need to establish is the need. What is happening in the status quo, right? We have to recognize that they lack the infrastructure, such as education, such as healthcare. They lack the basic needs that everyone in society has. Why is this very important? Because in, in order for me to develop as a country, we have to recognize that I need like a healthy and smart population so that they can work, right? I need innovation. I need all of this infrastructure to take, take care of my population. However, while you do not prioritize my own resources, I lack this economic ability. I'll be explaining this in my second point. So we think this is very important because this is what countries need to flourish. We think that the only option is resource extraction. Why? Because a lot of the other things that develop, developed countries turn to are things such as education, right? The technology sector. However, those things can't occur in my country because we simply don't have the education and the innovation to actually support these. So we have to recognize I need the like when we need the money, we think the only thing we can turn to is resource extraction, especially since the people are dying. But secondly, why is like why do I have like an obligation in terms of the government, right? Because we have to recognize that these are the people I made an obligation to. Like these are the people in my country. I shouldn't have to care what happens in the Maldives if I'm like living in some like living somewhere else. Because these are the people that I'm specifically like 
like task to take care of, right? They voted me in because they wanted me to represent them. They wanted me to make sure that their country was great. Not the Maldives that is somewhere else, right? I need to make sure that I take care of this. So we think that, but, um, but furthermore, we tell you this is actually simply exacerbating. We have to recognize that the root of the problem is not these countries, right? So me as a government, I should not punish my own people. I should not give them a lack of like healthcare, a lack of education, especially when it's the countries, like the developed countries' fault they are doing this. We tell you this is incredibly bad, right? So. Why do, we, why do we need to like look at this even more? Because we have to recognize the hierarchy of need, right? So even if we take them at their best, we have to weigh the population now versus the environment 40 years in the future. We have to recognize that the government has to support the population now, but even if, like, like even then, we think that the environment actually gets better on our side of the house, Karina's going to explain that more in her point. So we think it's very powerful, but it's the fault of these developed countries. I think that I shouldn't be able to prioritize my own people. Go. It's the fault of us in Canada driving our cars on polluting you. If we take away their ability because we take our resources away from them, how can they hurt us? Okay, I think that I've literally explained that more on my point, right? I've told you, like, that, yeah, exactly, it's Canada's fault, like, they should be the ones doing it, right? If, if Canada, like, if it's Canada's fault, they should be doing it, right? We should not punish people who do not have the same opportunities as us, because the thing is, if I take away the, uh, like, the uh, environmental resources, that, like, in these developing countries, they have nothing left. If I take it away from Canada, I still have the ability to innovate. I still have the ability to turn to other sectors to make sure my country is still okay. This is what is specifically important on our side of the house. So we have to recognize that these countries do have the right to develop, because the developed countries do so, we cannot punish them. Like if we look, for example, if we look at the United Kingdom like industrial revolution, that's how they got to development, right? And we should not be punished like 50, 60 years, or whatever, like how many years down the road, simply because that happened. Second idea, benefits of the country. So how does this actually strengthen the economy? So, firstly, resource extraction leads to more goods to export, right? So we think because like these countries are going to be so competitive, we're actually going to export cheap, and a lot of people are actually going to buy our countries. So we think that the government can come in and make money off of, like the tariffs, off of the like the selling, we think that we're gonna get this. But secondly, we actually tell you we get more jobs on our side of the house, right? Because A, when the government actively extorts, like they need workers to extort these resources, like extract these resources, people will get jobs there. But secondly, we tell you the companies will actually come in and get resources from the countries, thus creating more jobs. We tell you that's hugely beneficial on our side of the house, right? Why is this bad benefit to the country? A, we tell you that the government makes more money from trade and uses money to build infrastructure, such as hospitals, such as education. We think that's incredibly important, especially when we talk about this is the only way to develop. But secondly, we think that the government can actually tax the population more and thus increase the benefits because they now have the money to be taxed. But thirdly, we tell you that individuals can now give their families the opportunities and the basic needs they deserve, right? They can get the food they need, they can go to better schools, they can even spend frivolously and spend on programs that actually like that help me as a person, right? Like art schooling, right? They get more intelligent, they get smarter, they get better fed. But thirdly, sorry, sorry, fourthly, we tell you that these people actually get more purchasing power, right? This is especially important because now we have more companies incentivized to come into the country because there's a, like, a lot of money there. Therefore, they, like, the economy will grow as a whole because now like, you have a lot of people getting more jobs and putting back into the environment. All right. We think that this is especially important because of the development of basic infrastructure, the expansion of specialized programs, the spending and consuming of goods, the economic empowerment of individuals. We tell you this is hugely important because it leads to innovation, which in turn leads to the diversification of the economy in the long run. We can now put the focus otherwise. But how does this actually establish me on an international scale? First, we have to recognize that this gives me more economic independence. Because I'm no longer relying on things such as A, relying on things such as exploitative sweatshops to come into my country and give my people a job, right? I can reap all the same benefits and get this, but secondly, we tell you when you get trade partners, you establish yourself on like an international scale, you get these trade partners. It is on this basis we are so proud to oppose. Thank you. 
They started investing more in efficient heating systems and stuff like that. And the reason why that's the case is when developing nations can now say, I'm picking up my slack, there's no excuse for you not to pick up your slack. I think that's an incredibly useful tool to coerce these developed nations that they say commit all the pollution to actually pick up their slack as well. Okay, let's talk about pragmatic benefits, right? Their, I want to deal with their second point explicitly here, when they said this was good for the economy. I'm going to explain in my argument why this is actually really, really bad for the economy. And if you want to care for the, I don't know, 20, 30 years, or plus years down the road, this is actually the best policy to implement. But then, like, I just want to minor, I'll take you after this, this minor quibble, which is like, well, companies are just going to move to Canada, right? This is severely limited. It, the point is, it's very hard for a company to just move completely overseas and completely before, even if we can't completely destroy resource extraction industries. At least we can completely, like, severely limit them from doing the horrible stuff that they're doing right now with regards to damaging the environment. I think we do so quite well, sure. In Armin's speech, he simply said that green technology is very, very expensive. So what public services are you planning on cutting in these developing countries to be able to afford this? Right. So realistically speaking, green services have to be done on both sides of the house. It's just a question of when it has to be done. I dealt with this in my introduction. So either you could, you could just wait until the last minute to do so, in which time, in which case you won't have time or money to build the infrastructure, so, or you could do this now and gradually make that transition. I think, like, if, if they're saying that green energy is expensive, it's kind of a wash, right? That exists on both sides. It's a question of which side will have the money and the capability to meet those needs the best. Okay. Let's move on to my constructive argument about economic benefit, right? I have two subjects. <coughs> the first subject is about the nature of, set of the status quo. And they majorly conceded to this when they said, ah, many developing nations' economies depend and are built around these specific resource extraction industries. For example, Congo is built around the Coltan, uh, Botswana is built around, oh, thank you, the diamond tree. The problem is these are non-renewable and they'll eventually run out. So this leads me to my second subject about the transition. You need to diversify, you need to open new sectors. And there are two things I want to note here. First of all, you need to build a lot more infrastructure. So if you're a country that's relying on coal, you need to build lots of windmills, you need to build lots of hydro. More importantly, there's going to be a short-term economic slump, which we're ready to concede on our side of the house. You need the money to build that kind of thing. So why is it important to phase out of this uh, resource extraction to gradually? Because you need to do so while your economy is still alive. Comparatively, companies are probably going to be a lot more capable to shift out of it now. What happens on their side? When these things, first you could say, when these things run out, we say that there's going to be an economic crash because these companies Sir. are not going to thank you. These companies are not going to have the money to do this because the, the economy is on a consistent decline and they're not going to have the capacity to diversify. But more important, and this is something that they completely ignore. Last chance. What are we? Nothing. <laughs> 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 What's really important about the major environmental damage, and it's just, we, we don't think they understand this because they, their biggest priority is like education, but they don't really understand this. Once environmental damage is done, it's done. It's irreversible, right? The fact of the matter is glaciers won't be crystallized. Once this damage is done, you can't go back on it. More importantly, this is change that you realistically probably can never adapt to. My partner gave you an example of the Nile River. Eleven African countries rely on the Nile River for basic food and sustenance. I don't want to know what an 11-way African civil war is going to look like when they ruin this kind of thing. At least on our side of the house, we can gradually get these countries used to this and get rid of these resource extraction industries that have been so perniciously destroying these landscapes and harming the lives of people day in and day out. The reason why side opposition will lose this debate is because they don't recognize the comparison. We need to make change, and we need to make it now, and it's on that basis that I'm so incredibly proud of
speaker of the opposition to continue with their case. Thank you. 
how that research structures our country. So in that case, like, we'll have the exact same thing in our side pocket. But second of all, that isn't the case until you're going to get this great resources from places like North Carolina, like places like the Arctic region, where they have to get those resources that they need so dearly in their side of the house. After construction, the first idea that wasn't really actually answered was just the principal need of government have an obligation to helping their people. That's their role. Because like, that's their like, prime objective. They need to think about that also. Primarily, it's their main objective as a, like, a country in the developing world, especially. All they told is that, well, they're going to disproportionately affect like, their developing nation and also other countries. But first of all, why do I care about other countries that they're also harming me there? Like, like, it's in the developing world, they're going to continue whatever the hell they're doing there. But second of all, though, it's, really, it's more inherent when you have people literally dying on your street from hunger, from starvation. That's a more inherent need. So we can help these the environment later on in the future. We actually have the tangible things we need, like education, like food, like housing. Not right now. Second idea. Talk to you about the benefits to the country. We talk about more risk to export, things like jobs, things like infrastructure, things like purchasing power, things like no more dependence on countries with tight aid, for example, when we actually have our own sovereignty. And it's also about trade with the international market, when we actually have a voice in the international, like, and a voice on the world stage, the international means they can actually address any of the benefits. And all they're talking about is like the environment, but what are the benefits to the country? Why should the developed country not prioritize the economy over the environment? They're not actually addressing the idea of cash. We kind of see the like marginal harms of what happens to the environment, but we recognize we have a more inherent need to things like education, like things that will actually help us develop and then later on in the environment when you have the ability to do so. Because they aren't helping the environment on their side of the house when you have new infrastructure back here. Okay, that being said, let's get into this third point for your opposition about the environmental benefits. So first up, the ability to aid. So the first of this argument is that development companies don't have the resources necessary to aid the environment right now, but they can when they have development back here. What kind of resources are we talking about? Money, technology, infrastructure, things like that. We, tell you, we can't have these resources on proposition because they don't have any money to afford them. However, we get the cash flow from the research extraction, which will occur in opposition, do things like infrastructure, to have things like education, which will later on lead to things like development. In that case, once we are developed, we have the ability to actually aid the environment properly. So, second sub point. Second sub point. Though, we tell you the hierarchy of needs. If we tell you that this policy of environmental protection doesn't mean it will actually be carried out by people, etc. So, what's the hierarchy of need? We tell you the massive hierarchy of need, we think that these people have needs. It's these people here. It's their most inherent and fundamental needs at the bottom, and that's more like luxurious and not as inherent needs at the top. When you build a pyramid, you have to start at the bottom and go to the top. It's a similar idea with the hierarchy of needs that we need as people. So, the hierarchy of need has two significant impacts on two actors. First of society, and second of all, the government. So, first of society, the basic need of society in developing countries isn't going to be to like, help the environment as it like, is. The individual in a developing country is not going to be like, oh wow, I should recycle it because I have to help the environment. Your primary need and objective is to feed your family, for example. Because of this, you won't prioritize helping the environment when they can benefit from other things. So, not going to do things like recycle, not going to do things like they're going to do things like putting workers, for example, where it's easier for them if they're an extra company in that area, if it's easier for them to do things like driving really powerful cars and stuff. This is harmful, Madam Seekers. We tell you people are going to continue to actually be harming the environment in these areas without getting any of the benefits that we get. So, you tell you that most of the house, these like, marginal harms to the environment will be occurring. But listen, our side of the house, the end consequence is actual benefits to the environment later on. So, to have the actual ability to have like, development, for example, to be able to fund things like environment protection, you actually can do that. But at the end of the day, Madam Seekers, we tell you these countries don't have the ability to do so under the status quo. They don't have the money, they don't give them the money. I'm so proud of you.
Palestine and the rest of the world have reached a tipping point. Here's the problem, though. Side opposition seems to want to refuse to acknowledge it, especially when they say, these are marginal parts, or we'll ignore them, or we don't care what happens in other countries. Let me explain what that means. They're willing to prioritize education over the lives of millions of people whose countries are sinking into the ocean. We're not okay with that. That's why we're on composition today. What am I going to be doing in my speech? A couple of things. A few miscellaneous things I want to clear up so we can have a proper debate. Then two things. We're going to talk about the principle, we're going to talk about practical. It's pretty straightforward. Let's deal with it because we've won on both. So what's the like first thing under miscellaneous? Basically, they say, well, I just want to point out that what's going to happen with the environment is happening either way. The question in this debate is when do we address it? And get the points that out very well. And I think that will prove that which, on our side, we really have to address it right now because people are literally dying right now, not years in the future as they might try and attack you implicitly. Believe. Apart from that, essentially what they're saying is that while well, destruction is happening, we want to prioritize education. I want to get their Maslow's hierarchy of needs out right now because it's been consistent throughout their speech. Having an earth to live on is probably more important than whatever else they do. The last thing is that when they say, like, they try to call us on a contradiction about how we're going to be, like, aggressive in our policy according to Armin, but apparently we want slow change. Here's the thing. We're not saying shut off your pipelines right now and just screw your up like economy right now. But what we're saying is work toward shutting them off. Work toward getting to a point where you can shut them off. We don't think there's a contradiction on our side of the house. Great. That's dealt with. We can have the debate. Let's talk about the first of all. But before that, go ahead. I just want to quote your model. Armin specifically said, <laughs> aggressive transition, and if they're doing right now, they would stop immediately. Please no. don't be But literally, that is wrong. He's talking about people who aren't doing it right now should never do it, and people who are doing it should work towards stopping it. Okay, I think we finally sorted it out. Let's talk about principle. What have they told you in so far as principle? They say, first of all, who gives a damn? Not our problem, not our people. Well, first of all, it does hurt you. It is for people who are hurting. In fact, most directly, because where do you think all the pollution is happening to your water supply, to your crop? What do you think happened in Brazil? Their crops and all their land didn't go acidified because it was someone else who did it. It's because they were over farming, not anyone else. That's who you're hurting. But even if that was true, I think it's ridiculous for them to say our need justify us killing lots of other people in lots of other countries. That's just not true. And if it is, then they're basically calling out the developed country on something that they say is so critical, but then doing it themselves. We think that they have a principle of contradiction at the very least, as well as just justifying millions of deaths. Okay, what else did they take? The second thing is say we shouldn't do it, the developed countries should do it. So first of all, that's not an excuse. Are we correctly calls them out on basically saying we're gonna play a game of chicken and whoever flinched first is we hope that it wasn't before Sorry. Madagascar stop. What else did we do? But what else did we say, even if that isn't the case? Second of all, we literally forced them. We had a whole mechanism in Arvin's point about how we forced developed countries to take action. So maybe if you don't buy the example of it gives you on the AFL 100, let me just explain it very simply. Sir. There's two powers in the world, the private sector and the public sector. Let's deal with the private sector, first of all. Right now, they have no incentives because it's cheaper for them because they still have a market for like all their oil and natural gas, right? As long as we keep that market survivable and sustainable, that never changes. They want to keep doing that by actually giving them more of a market by harvesting more. We want to say, no, forget it, guys, you're hurting us. So we're not going to give you your oil, we're not going to give you your gas, because we're just not going to give you rights to mine in our country. We're going to kick you out as soon as we possibly can. Because of that, it means that they literally have no ability to make money off it, because the prices are just going to skyrocket at the point over like a gradual time, because it's just not have enough to keep selling it, right? What does that mean? It means that now we give them an incentive to invest in renewable energy, which is now where the demand is going to be going, which means we incentive renewable energy, which means there's going to be more funding, it's become cheaper and a lot easier to buy. So if they're so concerned about the price of renewable energy and how we get it, we will literally have the private sector building it for us and making it cheaper for us because there's money in it now. Okay, well, let's talk public sector. Public sector, they, we have a lack of political will, people don't care, and because the U.S. has kind of messed around with Supreme Court legislation, and Obama can't seem to pass legislation that will actually reduce the climate change issues up to the 30% from the Paris Conference, China started hedging, and because of that, because the U.S. and China were hedging, the world started hedging. At the point when we literally forced them to do this, because now they have no other alternative, you can't have any filibuster, you can't have any politicians saying it's not our problem, don't worry about it, guys. We don't want to deal with it, because they literally have to, otherwise cars won't run. That's where you get the political will we were talking about. Okay, great. I think I've dealt with the principle pretty damn well. Let's deal with the next thing. What did we tell you under the principle? No, thank you. So what have we told you under this? 
first of all, we told you that it's just completely wrong to say because it's our Earth, but we and we're polluting it, but other people polluted it too, we don't want to deal with it. That's just wrong. They say, well, look, at least we're still getting our money. We might as well make the worst of it if all the world's going to sink. We're trying to say we don't want the world to sink, and we think we have a pretty reasonable chance of doing that if we stop doing the thing that's hurting the world. They might as well not say, they're basically just conceding, we'll kill the environment, at least I have a nice education system. We don't think it's worth it. Okay, I think the principle on that, they're proving that they're pretty wrong in that respect, and that we're pretty okay with it on our side of the house. Let's deal with the practical. Let's deal with the effects. What do we hear from them? The first thing they do is basically just kind of clash with our case by saying, well, we need money to do it, and our side can do it better because we'll wait a long time and eventually have the money to invest in infrastructure. First of all, we question, the, we question whether or not there's actually going to be more money in, this, in the first place. Because to the extent that the resources are getting less and less resources, not more and more resources, that means that you're just going to have a like, slow, like, I don't know, a decline is the word I was looking for, no thank you, and how much money you're actually going to be able to make off it in the future. So we'd actually say that the time when you have the most money is now. But great, even if you don't buy that, we tell you it's still probably worthwhile now because we can't justify all the deaths that are happening and all the things that we can prevent on our side of the house by taking action now, especially if it's your own people that you're trying to protect. Apart from that, what they say is because we have benefits for our country, we can keep that because we want like spending power and all that stuff. Let's deal with this economic reliance point because they kind of harp on it. They say our country's going to fall to crap if we don't have this like oil like, money. First of all, we tell you we can adapt. The whole point of Aditya's case is telling you why if we adapt now, we can avoid the whole crisis of your economy collapsing because of the fact that we don't want your economy to collapse at a future point when there is no time to take new course. Now is literally the most time we will ever have before the things run out, and literally it just got shorter in the time I said that. Because of that, what we tell you is that it's probably best to take action while we still can and while we have more time so that we don't actually have to speed up the rate at which we cut stuff and actually get all the harms they're telling us. It's just worse on their side because they have less time to cut out all the stuff that is killing their people, killing the environment. We don't want to deal with that. Okay, what else did they tell us? Essentially, the next thing we tell us about the practical idea is like, how do we actually do it? Because we need cash flow, now we can spend money on development. First of all, we told you why there's probably more money on our side of the house if ever at any time, so we think that point falls, but even if not, it's still worth it to its full point. The second thing they tell you is that, like, Maslow's higher up needs. I dealt with that at the start. They, I think they even first analysis for that. The next thing, so what did we tell you about this? We told you, first of all, like, the economy, Aditya's economic point goes really well. And essentially, they just kind of denied it. They said that's just not true, right? It's not going to happen. You don't really have money. We're going to get more money to send us. That's just objectively false. But even if they did have more money on the other side of the house, how is that really going to work? Because all the money generated tends to go to like external companies. So we don't think that they're actually going to get like a net benefit on their side of the house. If they really want a net benefit, it's when they incentivize other groups that aren't put in their POI in a POI to actually come into our, our like come into developing countries and like build infrastructure for them so they don't have to spend it. They incentivize people to start spending, and if you want to generate jobs, it's probably when people are building lots and lots of infrastructure and renewable energy. They're concerned about building jobs, so on our side of the as well as all the economic points that they gave you that went largely unresponded to. Finally, we talked to you about the practical benefits about saving the economy. And basically, they said the country's going to get worse, it doesn't matter, and we can't afford it. We dealt with all of that stuff. So, because of that, we told you that we want all the economy and the environment. At the end of the day, I told you the world's reaching a tipping point. Don't push it over the edge. We are very proud of you. Principle. First of all, 
They gave you a lot of analysis about why the environment sucks, why the world is going to go to hell, and why we need to act now. Three responses. First of all, these developing countries necessarily have more of the obligation than the developed countries. They didn't prove to us why exactly it was that this was the case. But beyond that, the reason that I as an individual elect a government right now, elect a specific political party to care about my values, to choose what happens in my country, isn't so that I can protect what happens in the future 40 years down the line, it's so I can protect myself right now. The biggest mischaracterization that they had was that, you know what, we're cutting education. No, that's what developing countries have in the status quo. What you're cutting in things to the food, things such as water, that is the reality of the situation that you actually have on their side of the house. But secondly, the developed world isn't doing this, therefore the developing countries should. What is the problem with this? Because the premise behind this point, and Ali Khan specifically told you how right now there's a lot of political will inside of developed countries to stop things such as like environmental protection. The premise behind this point is that the people inside the developing world don't have enough political capital for the government to exploit them and have this environmental protection. That is the difference. The only reason why they can say that the developing world does, can't do this, so the developing world can do this, is because they understand that these developing countries can impede on their individual's rights to the point at which they put environmental protection over their most basic necessities. But beyond that, I think it's a huge mischaracterization when they say, you know what, once the developing world does it, the developing the developed world would do it too. Like it's not something that becomes mainstream, right? Instead what you're just going to get is a lot of complacency. Now what you're going to get is the developed world saying, you know what, all the developing countries are doing environmental protection. Why the hell should I care about environmental protection now? Because that is the complacency that you get when you propagate to the world that the developing country is going to do it. But specifically, this is a problem because these developed countries currently have a trend towards environmental protection. They're currently doing it. But when does this become a problem? When they understand that this environmental protection is already happening in the developing world. When they understand that people are dying for that environmental protection in the developing world, they think, why should I care about it whatsoever? That is the problem. You dis demobilize the current trend towards environmental protection. But next, they tell you that these countries have less of an ability to protect these individuals from natural disasters. Okay, then put it on their side of the house where they cut services for things such as hospitals, where they cut services for things such as actually moving these people away from the tsunamis, where the government doesn't have the ability to help these individuals anymore. That is what they have to defend on their side of the house. All right, is this what are the practical impacts? Okay, this is the biggest problem, and I think this is what they really need to address, right? The biggest problem is that they never actually told you what the harms are of this economic impact. They never really understood what exactly this actually means. Because yes, right now in the developing world, we already have to cut things such as education. Children already don't have education. But if that's the case, then what do they have to cut afterwards when you put in this environmental protection? That's why you have to cut more basic necessities than education. That's why you have to cut the next step, which is specifically things such as clean water, which is specifically things such as infrastructure to get this food. Because right now the developing countries are already cutting education. Now what you cut is the more basic necessities. But secondly, I think it's really ridiculous of them to suddenly assert that prioritizing education is such a bad thing. Why? Because if you want all the environmental benefits that they have, you need that innovation in order to get that. But when you have the proper education, when you make sure that these schools are built and properly funded, when they have normal science courses, that is when you tap into the brain power of everybody in the developing countries to actually go out and create these innovations. I think it's very mischaracterization mischaracterizing of them to suddenly say, oh wow, you're prioritizing out education. How horrible of a side are you? All right, let's take a look at what side actually limits the deaths, right? Because I think this is the biggest problem that their side of the house has. The first thing that they told us was that in the short term you hurt individuals, but then they talk about Madrid, which is happening probably like four years down the future. Why is it that in the short term gets a lot, lot worse on their side of the house? Because considering that developed nations are the biggest polluters, especially considering that fact, then there is no benefit at all on their side of the house. Environment, then these developing countries changing doesn't change anything at all. Keeping that in mind then, now what you do is just cut the basic resources
resources of the individual in the developing countries to not solve a problem whatsoever. But this is especially bad when those same developed nations now have the complacency that I already discussed. But secondly, I think that it's very harmful for them to just characterize this economic harm as a short-term harm, right? Because what this means is that you no longer have the infrastructure. What this means is you are no longer able to fund hospitals. That means that my generation is going to have children that is malnourished. I'll take one here in a second. That means that my generation is going to have feed into the future generation, which actually have to live in a world that is brand new of already go. What? Part of an economic transition involves like not feeding people anymore. Can't you have an aggressive transition that doesn't shut down hospitals? Okay, okay. okay. The biggest problem with that was that DT had told you that you need to build a lot of infrastructure in order to get that green technology in the first place. The biggest problem with that was that DT had conceded himself that you needed some sort of economic growth in order to have that green technology. The problem becomes that when you shut down literally the only thing that this government is actually profiting off of, that's where you have to cut all the goods and services in order to invest in green technology to protect those individuals 40 years down the future. That is the problem with their side of the house. All right, let's talk a little bit about economic benefits. Once again, major contradiction in the model when Ali Khan stands up later and says, you know what, it's going to be a slow progressive change. Why is this specifically a problem? Because when they say that it has to be a slow, gradual change, they can see to a lot of the benefits that this research exploitation actually has. They can see to the fact that these governments have to actively ensure this research exploitation <coughs> still continues. But beyond that, the biggest contradiction in their model came when Armin stood up in the first minimum speech and said, we will shut down everything right now. Why is that specifically a problem? Because I've already proven to you how the money currently needed is necessary for those services. And then afterwards, when this economy is prospering, when this resource extraction actually ends up getting this economic growth, that's where you can actually focus on environmental infrastructure. Because they miss the nuances of the hierarchy of need point. The hierarchy of need says these people need food before they can focus on environmental protection. These people need to survive right now before they can focus on their children surviving 50 years down the line. They need to address that. Madam Speaker, they've completely contradicted their points and completely mischaracterized the nature of these developing countries right now. That is why we oppose. Why that doesn't matter, and finally, this idea of independence. Firstly, principle. 
we had two very clear narratives that were clashing. A, why we should support our people specifically, and B, why we should support our world. Why is this a problem on their side of the house? Again, it reiterates that the like, developed world isn't ever going to stop, right? So the thing is that undermines their entire principle of actually helping the world, because the world isn't going to be helped no matter what. Karina also gave you specific nuanced analysis of why me, like I, like people voting me in, means that I have a specific obligation to my country. So, Madam Speaker, when I have to weigh, like, no helping the world at all, and like, having a good life, and helping my country, helping the people who put me into power, making sure they get an education, make sure they're not shackled by the developed world who has kept them in those chains, who doesn't give them opportunity on the basis of the world is going to hell, we think we take that approach. <coughs> Next. Why is it going to actually benefit the economy? Alright, so we, I mean, it's like clear analysis of why we get more jobs, right? We get, like, the country gets more jobs, we get more infrastructure, we get economic independence. What did it, uh, did it say? They basically said we can diversify now. Alright, so this is the, something that has been going on for the entire debate. It's what actually Armin actually said in his model. He told you that he actually said aggressive change, and they said, no, 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 progressive change. However, Armin in the last speech should give a POI about aggressive change yet. So we think, like, these two need to realize what Armin's saying and engage with it on that line. transition, you don't have the money to build an infrastructure, you don't have the money to build a green technology, you don't have to do any of this, we think this is a hugely harmful, we took this on our side of the house, right? We can move towards diversification of the economy when we build that infrastructure, we think we took that. The next idea of economic independence, this was largely unresponded to on their side of the house. We told you that right now these develop, the developing nations rely on it. They rely on exploitative sweatshops that give them pennies, right? They, the pollution happens anyways, yet they get zero benefit, right? They are so, like, at the will of the developed world. No response whatsoever. So we think on the basis that me as a developed nation gets more economic independence because I am now using my own resources to make sure that my people get better education, to make sure that we can, as a nation can develop and foster the innovation as a whole, we think that we take this. And finally, this idea of the environment. And I think I have already taken this by showing you and actually referencing the kid, like them conceding that it's going to like the world is going to like go to bad like anyways really clear right. So we think that they have never addressed over the 16 to like 30 the 24 minutes of constructive why me as a developed nation should give two hoots about what's happening, especially when the world is going to come. But why did I tell you it gets actually gets worse on our side? We told you this idea that pollution is going to happen in any case, right? Because you do have sweatshops. People are going to be very complacent, like Chris told you. They're going to stop, like the nations are going to stop recycling as well because they feel like they're going to do it. So we tell you the pollution on their side of the house actually gets much worse. But on our side of the house, we can do it in the future. Because when we have the economic incentive and when we have the economic ability by prioritizing our own environment to actually feed into this green environment, we think we can do this in the future. So at the end of the day, Madam Speaker, what is it we have to wait? We have to weigh the zero harm, mitigatory, at best, case they gave you on their side of the house. Versus principal empowerment, economic empowerment, independence, actually getting things done for our country, the country who put us into power, the country who made sure that we were going to take care of them. Ladies and gentlemen, because we don't know if the next Taylor Swift could be in a developing world, we are so proud to oppose. <laughs> Where he chose to say the word gradual over aggressive. 
Notice that the comparative is, and this was in the context of his point, it was the difference between an aggressive change whereby the government changes their economic system by investing in some energy sources over others, by giving licenses to some companies over others, not like defunding hospitals and like <laughs> shutting down food banks and whatever like they thought we were going to do. I've asked them to name one economic transition in history that has done that except for like Stalin's five-year plan. <laughs> This is why this was so important, because their third speech hung so much on this mischaracterization of our model, but it was so blatantly unrealistic that I think that, like, uh, anyways, okay. I want to talk about the developing world, why they should do it. Notice that this was the point they gave kind of the least in-depth analysis to, okay? And that's really important, because the Earth is being destroyed, and we should do something about that. Opposition said, why should we care? I need to ally to my own people. We said, okay, take them at their best. You are accountable to your people, which is why governments do things to your people. People in like Sri Lanka and the Maldives are not accountable for, to, for you, to you, therefore you cannot kill them, right? That was the principle in this debate where they said, like, why should we care about the Maldives and other places? Because like, I'm sure you did not want your country to be sunk by another country either. I'm not sure why that's such a principle difficult thing to then opposition says, so starvation is worse and we're going to cut food, right? So that's not true. But otherwise, we would say, look, they don't acknowledge that environmental destruction affects those things too. If you can't farm anymore because you don't have to your own land, soil erosion is causing the like, you not to be able to produce food. Why does that matter either on either house? That's why Edithia's point on like, we should do this now before we're in a state of no return was really, really crucial in this debate. And that's why they couldn't just dismiss it. Then they said, look, the developed world should do it because they started it, right? So we said, okay, fine. Even if the developed world somehow pollute more, which is just factually <laughs> true, they're still not addressing the point that a lot of pollution happens in the developing world. But if the developing world stands up to it, we create, we send the economic demand for green technology against these countries. I'm going to talk about this in a second. And then they're like, okay, it's a scapegoat because in the developed world, we'll be like, hey, look, we don't have to do it anymore. Like, we actually gave you an analysis to show you why that was the opposite. They just kind of threw some rhetorical light at you and hope that it's still going. <laughs> Second idea, why now? Unless they don't want the world to be completely destroyed, they have to acknowledge they need to do this at some point. So this is the idea of why they have to do that. They say, well, like, we'll wait till we're rich, and then we'll start to do it. And I think it did this point not only very clearly clashes with it, but they don't understand what the concept of permanent environmental damage means, right? It's not as if, like, we're just delaying some kind of, whatever, it's not that bad, right? Like, we're talking about the imminent destruction of billions of lives, and they're just like, well, whatever, we'll hope it works out if we do it later. Okay. Then they say, all right, well, the world is going to hell anyways, which was like kind of a much more pessimistic analysis coming out of their reply speaker than what Karina gave in her second speech. I don't know if that counts so much as case tension that like it's just really kind of depressing. <laughs> <laughs> that the developing world puts a large incentive on the developed world to change this because of that monetary influence. And even if that not, we also told you that, that sustainable development is completely possible. This is what the third theme is. Their entire case was hung on this. Because all they're saying is, we need to take everything out of the earth, because otherwise we'll starve to, we'll start to death, right? Not only did the Disney's reputation show you that that's not always the case, a lot of people are starving in countries with a lot of minerals that are being extracted at extremely fast rates. But we also told you that the only reputation they gave you to this was like two words. First, they said, trust that the technology will get better, right? We actually gave you analysis of how it gets better. Second of all, they only responded to this whole point about how we'll put pressure on them to change their economic incentive by saying, oh, they're just going to go drill in Canada instead. That's like very basic and limited economic understanding that doesn't really qualify as a response. So overall, we just don't think they've flashed in the way they should have. We think we've shown you that we're protecting what's evident. We're very proud to report.